Hello, I'm Sheila Hamilton and welcome to Beyond Well. As you may know, we are commemorating the milestone of releasing more than 200 episodes of our show. In all of the episodes of Beyond Well, there have been none so personal and poignant to me as those which focus on suicide. We've gathered up the most compelling episodes we've done on grief and we're going to highlight them in the coming weeks. Before we get started, we'd like to thank Active Recovery TMS for their support of our show. TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation, and with neighborhood offices to make it so convenient for you, Active Recovery TMS is your choice for transcranial magnetic stimulation in the Pacific Northwest. Active Recovery TMS has recently begun adding therapeutic sessions as well. And for more information or to find out if you qualify for treatment, go to activerecoverytms.com. And here's one of our favorites featuring Dr. Lejeune, Dr. Goth, and a discussion on suicide and the workplace, along with the insights of Lois Chauncey and Paul Sale. Enjoy. Welcome back to Beyond Well. I'm Sheila Hamilton here with Dr. Brian Goff. Hello, Brian. Hey, Sheila. And Dr. Jenna Lejeune. Hi. Hello. And I think it's really, really important to acknowledge how crucial it is to have support in the workplace for people who have lost someone they love to suicide. You know, the suicide rate now in Oregon has increased almost 30% in just the last 10 years. And so more and more people are starting to know someone who has died by suicide. And one of the things that's very difficult is determining how do I interact with that person? How do I support them? How do I show them that I still love them? And that's why we invited today Lois Chauncey and her supervisor, Paul Sale. Really good to see you guys. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me here. Paul is Lois's supervisor, and we're not naming where you work just for confidentiality reasons, but I really appreciate both of you and the, and the support of your company in talking about suicide prevention and also allowing you to take time out of your day to be here today. Yes. So, Lois, tell us the circumstances about your husband's death, if you would, what year it was, what was going on at home, and what what were the circumstances that led to his suicide? Um, Bill, who is my husband um, of almost 20 years, actually um, chose suicide earlier this year in May, on May 8th. And um, he had been battling fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis for over 15 years. So as you can imagine, chronic pain, Mm. depression is a risk factor with that. Although um, as a precaution, he was on antidepressants and had been for years. So Um, you know, he was larger than life in many respects. He had a phenomenal personality, loved people, loved to reach out to people, um, could light up a room with a smile and the way that he approached and cared for people. Mm -hmm. And you would never suspect what was, what he was battling in his head, a balance between what we now think was handling the pain and seeing the long-term outcome potentially from all of this pain and then depression. And, um, but as a general rule, um, he was just happy, go lucky, happy to be around people, extremely genuine and just exuded kindness. Mm -hmm. Uh, we recently moved to Portland from Indiana and I came out here about eight months ahead of time, went back several times, number of times, all was well, seemed fine no indication that he was even contemplating this. And he came out in April and was excited to get a job offer, but I don't think he was really being realistic with himself in terms of the physical requirements of the job. Mm. And about a week into the role, he realized, you know, gosh, this is really physical and I'm in excruciating pain. And maybe perhaps under the influence of pain meds to the, to a degree, um, he saw no way out, and he, he chose suicide. So, um, um, Do you have children at home, Lois? Um, we have adult children. I do have yeah. one living with me, but um, they're all adults. When, when you learned of your husband's death, and generally it's such a traumatic mm-hmm. event, um, were the kids in the home, the adult children, were they at home at the time? Yes, one of my um, greatest... Uh, sadnesses, if you will, was my uh, daughter received the news from the police by herself. 
Um, and my son was upstairs sleeping and he came down. And so then he was told, and I actually was the third person notified by the police at the time. Um, she was able to get our pastor there and he actually took over the notification process, which was fortunate. But, um, yes, my children actually had to learn that and they were advised not to call me because they knew I would be traveling home and, and they were concerned about my well being. So, they had about an hour and a half where they carried this weight without my knowledge, and it, it is um, been something that has been really tough for all of us. The reason I ask that is because I think, you know, I'm always looking at the similarities between people who die of other diseases or disorders, and suicide carries this extra trauma. It carries mm -hmm. a kind of um, almost violent, difficulty to it that that people don't experience and so I want to start with that as one of the differences that can be acknowledged when someone dies by suicide is that there is this compounded trauma to the family mm -hmm. talk about the other things as you know on top of the shock and sadness that you were going through yes as um recent recently moved to Portland so we're recent residents um I had had the opportunity by coming out early to get to know people, but I still didn't have a ton of people. And um, I was about two and a half months into a new job and loved the coworkers, loved my boss, loved the company, and fortunately felt very um, supported there. But immediately I was concerned I was going to lose my job if I took time off. Mm -hmm. um, as I quickly found out, the place that I was employed by that would have, was the farthest thing from their mind. They wanted to support me, and wow, did they ever. Uh, but kind of working through that and navigating, oh my gosh, if I make this call to my boss to tell him what happened, I knew that wasn't his personality, but he had to work within the framework of the company, and I wasn't exactly sure how that would pan out. This is such an important point right here. The shame and the stigma that we all have because of suicide extends to the suicide loss survivor. And that immediate thing of, I don't even know if I deserve to take time off because my loved one died this way is real. Absolutely. Absolutely it is real. And one of the things that happens is, you know, if I'm giving people the benefit of the doubt, the people surrounding you, surrounding the survivor, they often feel like they don't know what to say, they don't know how to respond, and so what they do is they don't say anything or they just kind of keep their distance. And what that does when somebody's experiencing shame is it sort of reinforces oh, maybe there is something shameful here because look, everybody's like, you know, how when somebody falls, you know, trips outside and you kind of like avert your gaze. Like, we have learned that, oh, if somebody isn't looking at this, this must mean I'm doing uh, something shameful is about me. And so it's the worst thing you can do. What I would say is, even if you don't know what to say, even if you're afraid you're going to say the wrong thing, say something mm. so that the person isn't so alone in this place of feeling like nobody else could possibly understand and there's so much shame around it. Paul, I want to bring you in if you don't mind because you probably, um, I don't know what kind of previous training you had in dealing with something like this, but it must have been a shock to you and a very quick education about how to deal with this as well. Yeah, so obviously I got a text from Lois, but it wasn't a full story and that night we actually had a phone call where she said um, what had happened. And her, honestly, her immediate response was, I don't want anyone to know. And I said, well, we're going to talk about that later, but we're going to, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And, and I said, take care of yourself. I'm going to check it up on you, but I also need the members of your family, numbers from your family members, because I need to know who's taking care of you. Mm -hmm. um, but immediately all, all I said was, we're not going to solve this situation. How are you? And I'm sorry. And because we both share a common faith, and I knew that, I said, I will be praying for you. And I said, anything you need, we're here to support. Don't contact me about work. Just do what you need to do. And I think that's where we left it that first night. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right, Lois? It was. It was phenomenal. I am um, going to have to, like, I know, gather that myself. I know, that just brings tears just, to my it eyes. It does bring yeah. tears. Mm -hmm. The, the yeah. humanity around the way you handled that, Paul, is so unbelievably beautiful 
And so most managers aren't trained this way. How did you know how to react, how to be in that moment? I don't necessarily know if I know, um, but I do know that people are the most important. And I've been through enough in life to say walking in their shoes and letting them know that it's okay to be sorrowful and have pain um, is better than to say it'll all be okay because mm-hmm. we don't know what will be okay and what won't be okay. And so I've even had some personal things in the past where you just have to have somebody that sits with you. And I think this is the difference between empathy and sympathy. Mm-hmm. You need somebody that says, wow, I don't even know what to say, but I'm here. Yeah. When, when Jenna was saying, you know, say something, my thought was, if you don't know what to say and, and the instruction is to say something, say, I don't know what to say. Mm-hmm. I don't have a point of reference here. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, I love that it is just, it comes down to we're just, we're people. You're not alone. This doesn't have to get fixed. It's not going to be fixed. I will walk with you. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I noted after my late husband died by suicide is that if he had died of cancer, there would immediately be flowers and bouquets and casseroles and people would be over in the house and there's almost stone silence. So one of the things that I want to say is as a person who might be listening and say, how do I support it? Drop the method of death and consider that that person has suffered a death of a loved one. Drop the method, drop it from, and do all the things that you would do. You talk about fond memories of that person. You talk about how wonderful they were in your lives. You bring by the casseroles, you bring by the flowers. If we could just get the method of and our, you know, fixed beliefs about what this means, we would be so so much better off that you could actually work human to human rather than Mm -hmm. trying to figure out how we deal with this public health crisis. You were super smart in that you wrote a letter to your colleagues. And if you have a moment to read it, I would really appreciate it, Lois. Sure. This is, um, I ended up taking three weeks off and um, I wanted to work from home for a couple of days before I headed back in. But I also wanted to set the tone for my team because I felt like they needed to know that it was okay to talk about it. Um, and I wanted to share some thoughts of, that I had about returning to work. So here's the email I sent to them. Hi, everyone. I wanted to let you know that I am returning to work today. I will be working from home today and tomorrow and then back in the office on Monday. In the meantime, I wanted to share some thoughts to hopefully minimize some of the uncertainty and potential awkwardness that you may be feeling in regards to approaching or talking with me over the next few weeks and beyond. Here goes. Number one, I would not be back to work at all if it were not for you, your thoughts, prayers, support, notes, cards, flowers, text, attendance at the service, and the list goes on. Thank you for all that you have done to help me and my children get back on my feet. Don't withhold your feelings or emotions out of fear of hurting or impacting mine. The emotions surrounding death are tricky, and as a general rule, I want to hit them head on. However, there are going to be days when I or you can't. Let's acknowledge this now and agree up front that we may need to just say, I need some time, or today's not a good day. We can always circle back when the time is right. Number three, you likely have questions about what happened, and I understand that. I will share what I feel that I can, keeping in mind that with any suicide, there are a million unanswered questions. My family has agreed that we will talk about what happened to the degree that we can in the hopes that our story will save lives. My ability to speak about the events of May 8th will become easier as the emotions become less raw, so I appreciate your patience with me. There are a number of everyday phrases and sayings that we all use that when filtered through the lens of death or suicide may appear to take on an insensitive tone or quality when used. For example, my foot is killing me, or I'll die if I just don't get to see so-and-so in concert. I have noticed people are censoring themselves the and these statements around me after what has happened, and my ask is that you don't. These phrases are a part of daily life, and I don't want you walking on eggshells around me. Please do not censor yourselves to protect me. 
Number five, please laugh. This is my number one ask. I know what a fun group you are, and I have missed you and the daily laughter that is the very fabric of our team. And finally, there could be tears, and I may need to excuse myself. Please don't take this personally, because it won't be because something you said or did. Thanks again for everything you have done for me and my family. I have witnessed what it means to be a part of a great work family over the past three weeks, and it is amazing. See you soon. Lois. Wow. Wow. That's so beautiful, Lois. And one of the things um, that I'm hearing from that letter is please don't be too careful around me. Please don't kind of tiptoe around me. And that goes back to something that you said, Paul, that just really struck me. You responded with essentially like, it's okay not to be okay. Like you, this is just going to be this, this profound suffering and there's nothing we're going to do to like fix that. And I think that message can give Lois this freedom to also tell other people like, you don't have to be careful around me because it's okay if I'm not okay right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just think that is so beautiful. Just beautiful. Let me, let me also say, I agree with what Jenna's saying. It, like, feel free to laugh, right? Like, because I'm struggling, it doesn't mean I'm fragile. I suspect some of that laughter, and I could be off on this, but I suspect that some of that laughter, what I heard was those two things right next to each other, laugh, and there will there may be tears, is that, you know, don't be surprised that you may see me crying. Also, don't be surprised if you see me laughing. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that there's this like, mm-hmm. you better be okay with the fact that I'm suffering or that I'm struggling. But that's not 100% of the time. Like sometimes mm-hmm. I'm listening to a song and I'm not thinking about how it relates to my husband. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes the thing that bothers me the most in this work day is the deadline on this project I'm working on. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And then I'll be fine. And then like a sneaker wave, I'll head to the bathroom and cry and or just Mm -hmm. sitting at my desk. And that's going to be okay too, that it seems to me like those things just sort of ride alongside of each other. And I mean, at least for me, I feel a lot of things at the same time. Right. Paul, I want you to jump in here because I think what Lois is speaking to is so essential because suicide loss survivors are also at a greater risk of mental health conditions, depression, and suicide in the wake of another person's death. So work as a means to getting back into the world is so crucial for people. How did you make sure to normalize it at the same time? Make sure to keep that tenderness afloat that you had on the first night that you spoke with her. Well, I think one of the things Lois and I talked a lot about was when she came back, we had to monitor it quite a bit. So if she came back and then she decided I came back too soon, we had a deal where she had to tell me that. It was also uh, kind of built into our discussion about whether or not I told her team the reason for Bill's death or the the method of Bill's death. Mm -hmm. And we talked a lot about this. And I said, your team, once you come back, will support you. They want to support you. They want to show love to you. But they need to know a little bit more Mm. because some days you're going to be angry. Some days you're going to be sad. Some days you're just going to be questioning. And I think one of the things we talked a lot about for work is work in itself wasn't the reason you're coming back. It's because it's part of who makes Lois healthy. Right. And it has to be part of that whole thought process. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this because she was worried about being behind on projects. And I said, some of these projects have been behind for five years. One extra <laughs> month doesn't actually matter. So I think it's actually, to, to, the point, to the point is, we have to have those level of conversations and say, you're right, and you may not even be as effective as you want when you get back. You're probably going to be in a right. fog. So mm-hmm. I think it was just actually calling it out and saying, I get it. Mm-hmm. So let's make sure that you're still you. And we, and we figure this out together. So that's a longer term view of the person and even of the role. 
I'm so struck, especially by your company's willingness to acknowledge that employees don't check their personal lives at the door. We bring our whole person to work. We always have. And the idea that we could ignore what was going on in people's mental health or their personal lives is so archaic and so opposite of what creates a well-rounded, optimistic, and really hardworking employee. And productive. Right, Mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. I want you to speak a little bit to how the culture is changing for you and the willingness of your company to say, let's let's talk about this. Um, I think deep down the culture was always, the desire was always to be a company and a people that are like that, um, that are open and willing to walk through life with each other. But I think we've always been afraid of, um, as employees, of opening up at work, which is only uh, mm-hmm. odd because we spend more pe- more time with these people than anybody in our lives. And you said something earlier, which is so true, is employees don't know how to respond to their coworkers, but they desperately want to. Mm-hmm. And so I think one of the things that's been good in our society lately with this issue and other topics is we're finally saying, how can I help? Mm-hmm. Uh, instead of I'm going to fix you, it's how can I help? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've been so, as a society, so focused on fixing things. Um, and this is just one of those things that never is going to get fixed. That's exactly but right. But we need to learn how to walk with each other. And I think we desperately want to as humans. We just didn't feel um, open at work to have that level of vulnerability. And mm-hmm. I think that's what companies, not just our company, are striving to see that to link with their employees' hearts, you have to let them feel. No doubt. Mm -hmm. Lois, this is so recent, a trauma. How are you doing? Um, Good days and bad days. Mm -hmm. Um, I suspect you know a lot about that. Um, You know, a month after my husband died, my dad died suddenly. And so we were back in the throes of it. And I remember making that phone call to Paul. And I'm like, I'm probably just so fired at this point. But I've got to go because there was a window that I might get to see him before he, he passed. But you, you mentioned something in, in another talk and then also today about how people do treat suicide so differently. And I noticed that immediately and how people responded to my dad's passing mm-hmm. and responded to the family versus how they responded in Bill's passing. And it is different. Um, there were, you know, what a great life he led, you know, when it was long life and, and when they were referring to my father, but there wasn't a lot of discussion about my husband. And yes, we were new and people didn't really know him, but I will tell you when he was living and we were in um, our previous uh, places uh, where we've lived, people could not wait to get to know him because he was such a great person, Mm -hmm. but we don't see that here. And it can be, that's, that's something that can help to isolate people and, um, and family members of suicide that people are hesitant to talk about because they're afraid they're going to upset or they're not really sure what to say. And, um, you know, as Paul said, it's okay to be not okay and just say something. I mean, just say something. Give those folks an opportunity to talk about that person, their loved one, uh, to talk about what happened and just to listen. And I've got a number of people who've done that for me. Mm. Um, I've got two gentlemen who knew I was really missing my husband and I needed some guy time. And so they invited me to go on errands with them. (laughs) And it was phenomenal. It was one of my best days yet since that's happened because... It's that sense of normalcy. You just crave it. It's like, I want to be like it used to be. And you know it won't be like it used to be, but you can get glimpses of it. And to feel that sense of normalcy and feel human again, um, it is just, it's wonderful. And it's so important. I I will say after um, Sophie's dad died, I, I had this same experience where she was not getting the storytelling that happens at funerals. And for some odd reason, just because of the manner of death, people forget that this was a living, magical person. Mm -hmm. And so I actually wrote about 25 people and said, please send the best experience that you had with Sophie's dad. It's one of my um, most memorable things is Sophie going through those letters and reading these memories 
that people oh, didn't so share at a funeral and they didn't tell her because they didn't know whether they would upset her. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I'm so struck by um, how, how much this brings back that period, of course, for me, but also just the resiliency that you show, Lois, is so beautiful. And I think it in part is because of the support that you've had from Paul and the other people mm-hmm. at work. Thank mm-hmm. you. And your pastor who's sitting there. Hopefully mm-hmm. we'll get you in to talk about how we can deal with this in religious life as well. Thanks again, all of you, for coming in today. And I wish you the very, very best, Lois. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And that was the show. Thanks for your support of Beyond Well. If you like what you hear, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts and spread the word to your friends. If you want to reach me individually, you can always reach out at Sheila at Beyond Well Media. I hope you make it a great day. Bora Health is a nonprofit alcohol and drug treatment center in Portland, Oregon, that has been helping youth, adults, and families for nearly 50 years. They offer compassionate, comprehensive, and affordable care for everyone, regardless of background, orientation, or ability to pay. Bora recently opened a new state-of-the-art campus in Portland's Southeast Gateway District, and the entire campus is healing and supportive. You can find out more about their full array of evidence-based therapies for drug and alcohol treatment at www.forahealth.org. If you or a loved one needs support, there are many options and personalized approaches to care. Reach out to Fora Health at 503-535-1151 or see the show notes for more details.